Hey everybody, I'm Greg Soul, and this is Why Am I, a podcast where I talk to interesting people and try and trace a path to where they find themselves today. My guest this go around is Saskia Wilson-Brown. Saskia has been in and around TV production for some time, uh, even being part of the Silver Lake Film Festival in LA. She's also a great podcaster, and by the way, has founded and runs the Institute of Art in Olfaction. More than that, she's a driven artist that tears walls down so that people can connect with each other and connect with arts of all kinds, no matter who wants to keep the secrets locked away. She's kind of a badass. At any rate, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Saskia. Saskia Wilson-Brown? Did I say that right again? Saskia. 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 All right. What's what's the origin of that name? It's Dutch. It was uh, Rembrandt's wife. One of well, one of Rembrandt's wives was called Saskia. God, you are extremely international. You are uh, uh... parents. <laughs> <laughs> well, not only I mean by name, but also by heritage and by uh, upbringing, because you kind of were all over the place, right? A little bit, yeah, yeah. Mostly California, but but yeah, there was some France in there. Yeah, just a little bit. Just enough to give you, yeah. yeah, so you could brag about it. I get it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and then you drop it in conversation. Okay. Smug comes out. Anyway. Fly. Fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I am going to say that we are waiting in line somewhere because these things always start as us queuing up in some place or another. So I'm going to look at your uh, fantasy restaurant and I'm going to say we are in fresh fruit market and we're gonna we're getting uh, you're gonna get plantains so you're gonna get the good ones not the bad ones and uh you know there's a bit of a line we're queued up we're talking having a conversation i tell you who i am i'm really boring there's not much going on here so we move on fairly rapidly and it's your turn to reciprocate so who are you oh are we already in line <laughs> we are yeah okay uh well i'm saskia wilson brown uh and i am um the founder and director of a nonprofit uh, called the Institute for Art and Olfaction here in Los Angeles. Um, and beyond that, I'm many things, but that's sort of my, my top line introduction, I guess, uh, as to who I am. Wow. Oh, interesting. Okay. So the Institute of Art and Olf Olfaction, right? Okay. So, right, olfactory has to do with like sense of smell and things like that yeah. right so mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that and why you would make it a nonprofit. why why go that route yeah well it's a, it's a fair question because most people who engage with the sense of smell are engaging with it through perfumery i mean i'm sorry i should say consciously engage it's like you're smelling perfume you know which is definitely not an, a non-profit industry so <laughs> yeah i mean i became in, interested in, in perfume as a field because i was sort of i read a book actually called The Emperor of Scent by a guy called Chandler Burr. And it talks about a scientist called Luca Turin and how he was trying to prove or, or sort of, yeah, prove how we smell. And his theory was the vibration theory and, and the prevailing theory was the shape theory, whatever. Long story short, uh, the book also really covers how the industry works. And I thought it was pretty fascinating, particularly because the industry uh, was set up in a way that's extremely Eurocentric and that's very, um, generally speaking, has or actually still is quite closed to the to the everyday person. You know what I mean? So there was a degree of remove and of sort of exclusion exclusion that I thought was super interesting. I was just like, what is this, and why is it so closed? You know? So so I started the Institute for Art and Olfaction because I wanted to engage with smell, but I also wanted to engage it with it in a way that was public facing, that was sort of collaborative, that was open <laughs> you know to whoever um so so i decided to make it a nonprofit because i was going to focus mainly on sort of arts projects and, and education and experimentation and for that you need to be a little bit removed from trying to make money because you know art doesn't pay the bills as we all know so i embraced <laughs> that <laughs> and that's why i made this uh, a nonprofit. so you said the fact that it was closed and secretive is what was the most attractive or intriguing thing for you? Why, why do you think that is? Uh, well, it's closed and secretive because it's based, I mean, I'm, I don't know, there's a short answer and a long answer, but to summarize, it's based on um, 
well it's an industry you know what i mean like it's like like the automotive industry you know we all we all buy cars we all drive cars but it's it's a big step from buying and using a car to to making a car you know and it's kind of the same in perfume like we all engage with perfumery as a product but in terms of actually making it uh, that the, there, there was no access, you know, um, and this is based on culture. It's based on trade secrets. It's based on intellectual property. There's a whole bunch of reasons for it, but the result is that we can't really engage with this except as a product. Hmm. Uh, and for that reason, I felt that that was, I felt that that was unlike a car. There was, there's, it's, it's portable. You know what I mean? Like you can, you can do it if you know how. <laughs> So I, I just felt like there was a bit of a disconnect there between um, what perfume could be, or what working with scent could be, and what it was. Well, that explains why the industry is secretive, but why did that secretive nature like attract you? Because you said oh, it was yeah. particularly interesting. What about, is that is that something in your personality where, uh, where the more yeah, something bit. is I obtuse, mean, the more it pulls you in? Yeah, definitely there's a little bit of like personal, well, there's also a little bit of a, you know, an F you in there because <laughs> the, the reason it attracted me was because, well, first of all, I was working at a TV network and in film or whatever, when it was right, right after YouTube hit. So we were just in that transition when, you know, they were democratizing the media. So, and I was really engaged in that. And so when I learned about the perfume industry, I was already primed to sort of think about the idea of access and democratization and all that. Um, and so the perfume industry felt like a perfect example of a space that hadn't been quote, democratized yet. Hang on one second. I'm just going to cough. I have to apologize. I'm recovering from COVID still, so I'm still yeah. a little bit. Rawr. No brain, worries. Yeah, brain, I'm brain surprised fly. you even agreed this fast. So appreciate. Yeah, it. well, I'm better, obviously, but um, I have a little bit of a dry throat still. So yeah, so 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 that sort of closed nature was interesting, and then it was aligned with what I was doing in in film and TV. And then on top of that, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm from the American West, you know what I mean? Like we're not, it's not a culture of, of, of exclusion, you know, generally, I mean, it is to a degree, but generally speaking, at least where I'm from in California, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, cool, let's do it. You know, that's sort of what we gravitate towards. And I found that to be very contrary to what I was hearing from people within the perfume industry, which was a whole bunch of no. You know, no, you can't do that. No, you can't study with me. No, you can't. Hmm. So I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a little bit of um, a challenge, I guess, you know. And then also it makes no sense because if everyone's always saying that perfume is an art form or working with scent is an art form and, you know, art, art making is our, is our right as human beings. So um, sorry, if you're going to say it's an art form, then you got to let people do it. You know, that was sort of what what I was thinking when I, when I became interested in, in it. So just from the periphery looking in, I, it seems like, I don't know, I from judging from the, all the bottles behind you, it feels like it's equal parts art and science. I mean, is how would you kind of quantify the balance there? Yeah, well, yeah, it's sort of, so I don't engage in the science at all. Like what, for, for me, what, what I'm doing, most, most people I'm doing is you're getting, you know, a nice smell in a bottle and you're getting a pipette and you're you're dropping it's cooking it's more cooking than anything else but cooking is science <laughs> it, yeah exactly but like cooking it, there there's chemical you know underpinnings to to what happens you know mm -hmm. so i don't know i'm not much of a cook but the mayor effect in cooking you know we have we have our equivalents we have something called um oh lord i'm forgetting the name um shift spaces and perfume where two and two doesn't i'm sorry one and one doesn't always make two it makes something else entirely and hmm. and then a lot of these molecules are developed by chemists in laboratories so they're they're new molecules that are invented in a lab so science underpins the whole thing in a way you know so it sounds like you were talking about kind of the science and there is that but that's not what interests you or pulls you in the most it's kind of more the the art aspect um what about smell specifically? Because it's, I'm looking at your background and you have a very interesting pedigree. Like you were talking about, you kind of started in television production and you've, sounds like you've done a lot of producing, not just um, shows and things like that, but also events. I see in your profiles, because you are very prolific on the internet, uh, I see the Silver Lake Film Festival coming up a oh, lot. Yeah. So really? I'm an outsider. So wow. I don't, I don't know like where that sort of, 
fits in. Um, yeah. Like, it must be monumental because everybody always mentions that in your profile. Or is that huh. something That's that everybody in LA would really know? Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess, I don't know. It's hard to quantify like how, what impact that thing had. But so, well, I can tell you a little bit about like sort of how I came to where I came to be if, if yeah. that helps. But yeah, so I studied art, you know, so I'm an artist at the core, you know, and I, I perceive myself as an artist. So, but within that, you know, art is not something that is very easy to make a living at, especially in the U.S. So. When I moved back to LA um, from my from my, uh, my my degree, I fell into sort of film production, mostly art department, so set design and things like that. And from there, I, I joined the board of this film festival, the Silver Lake Film Festival, which I ended up co-directing for a couple of years. And so it was like a, a purely outsider, independent. I, I'd, I'd even hazard a guess to say it, or I'd even. I guess call it sort of punk rock, you know, in that it was just so totally outside of the mainstream. But, you know, because LA has such a rich film culture, there's so many people who come here to work in film and a lot of them end up, you know, inadvertently often being independent filmmakers because they just can't find the gigs within the industry. So there is a lot of people working in film and, and people who are film adjacent, like, you know, musicians or you know, I don't know, like we had Keith Morris from the Circle Jerks. And I mean, it was all people that were really arty and a little bit on the edge of, of the mainstream. So it was hugely important to me. I was quite young when I when I co-directed it and it left me in like lots of debt, <laughs> like, <laughs> like an inordinate amount of debt, which was a real bummer on my credit card. So I ended up taking a job at this TV network when it was offered. And that's how I paid off my debt. Um, but that really gave, got me very interested even more in sort of mainstream practices versus independence and how the independence can survive, you know, when faced with these sort of corporate behemoths, you know, in, in film, in TV or in perfume, it's all the same. I mean, the power dynamics are the same. So it's really about the power dynamics that the power dynamics are what interests me, whether it's film or perfume or art. It's why, why are some people so powerless? And how can we change that? Interesting. Yeah. I so, think it's interesting. <laughs> you said, I mean, you, you classified yourself as an artist with a capital A. That's what I heard. Um, and how long have you, how long have you considered yourself an artist? Like, does that go way back from when you were a kid? Yeah, I guess it does. I mean, it's one of those things where it's sort of hard to, I, I also, you know, calling yourself an artist always sounds like, pretty arrogant you know what i mean so <laughs> you know what it's so funny i've talked work. to a lot of artists and every one of them has struggled to call themselves an artist yeah i it's, don't it's know a why hard thing yeah but you I guys have I such think... hang-ups about that yeah it's true but but I, I think because you're faced with sort of like all the all the cultural structures within art which is an industry you know and it's like unless i'm showing at some blue chip gallery can i call myself an artist but actually yeah you can because it's it's an impulse not an act you know um yes no i don't know i thought i, th I think i i had like the art artsy side of me came out pretty early i think but i was also in a pretty bohemian environment where i think it would have been weird if it hadn't come out you know my dad's in the arts my mom is i wouldn't say she's an artist but she's certainly artsy um so yeah but my undergraduate i was meant to i wanted to study psychology and social welfare but i was f really phenomenally lazy you know <laughs> i just could not be bothered to do the classwork and i found myself in the art department and it was something that came easily i i i, I was motivated to do the work so i think if laziness <laughs> is any indicator like this was the only thing i could i could do you know um and that changed a little. I'm a little less lazy now, but I, I just, it's either laziness or ADD. I'm not sure which, but I cannot focus, you know, and art calms the mind for me, you know, so it was always just something that happened. But I was never a great artist, you know, I was never someone who people saw talent in. I was good. I was good enough. I could write a good essay, you know, but I was not ever going to be a great artist. It just, it just wasn't. It wasn't, it was never going to be my path. And that was pretty clear early on, you know, and I'm okay with that. You know, it's, mm. we all have our, our thing. <laughs> what kind of artist was your, uh, your father? My father, well, he was a, he was a conceptual photographer. So he did all these very, um, like a lot of self portraits, 
this is in the 70s and the late 60s. Uh, and he, you know, he, he's a Cuban guy and he's got the, he had this big, like 1970s Afro, you know, he's, <laughs> and he, he looked cool, you know, so there's all these portraits of him looking soulfully into the camera with this big Afro going on. And it just, it, and it, it all had like some high concept, you know, it was about relationships and it was about his identity as, as a Cuban person, an immigrant in the U S um, I, you know, no one would have talked about it in those terms then, but the idea of being a person of color in the U S mm -hmm. you know, um, but also being someone who's extremely prolific, had a lot of success. He was also a politician. He ended up in politics. So he was <laughs> very successful. I mean, extremely successful in uh, his career. So he was very well folded into American society, but he was also a little out, you know. So he sort of examined that a lot through through his artwork. And then there, I actually recently found a whole bunch of his work in a suitcase he left at my, at my house. <laughs> and, there was this big piece about my mother, actually, how she kind of took him. I don't know. She ate him up and just spat him out. You know, she was very tough on him. So it was a lot of self soul searching about relationships. You know? It's really it's cool. I don't mean to make light. I mean, his work is really interesting, but it's my dad, you know, so I can't help but be a little yeah. like, all right, dude. <laughs> yeah. You'll always see him through that lens. Yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, poor dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, but yeah, it sounds he was, like he's a cool guy. It sounds like you definitely had like the gift of gab and uh, the ability to kind of navigate crowds and things like that. Oh, still does. He's the most charming person. He he he's char he charms everybody. He's so charming. Mm. He's, he's really lovely. But um, yeah. did your dad set the bar for what an artist looks like to you? You know, I guess when I was a kid, he would sort of graduated from art, and he was more of a, a sort of he was in politics. So, but he was in in the arts. So he was a public policymaker in the arts for the city of LA. So I think he set the bar in terms of the impact that art should and could have in society and the fact that it actually really does matter, you know, because it's easy to sort of, oh, well, it's just art. It's not going to cure COVID, you know, I mean, and that's true, but, but without our art, we, we are, we are nothing, you know, we're just a series of bodies getting through the everyday boredom of, of life. So I think, I think he installed a real value in, in what it is, what it can be, and and also a sense that it is for everybody. So these structures of exclusion, you know, whether it be you know blue chip galleries to the fragrance industry to I mean in radio like Clear Channel, you know, these structures of exclusion are actually doing a disservice to society because they're ridding ourselves of, of creative expression, you know, or the capacity to express ourselves creatively. Mm. Uh, and that's something I get, I definitely get from my dad. That's interesting. Yeah, like the idea of how what, the way you said it, what art could and should do that kind of he instilled that value. Do you think do you think that colored the lens through which you look at your own art and maybe think, well, because earlier you said that you were your art was always just good enough. Do you think that was because you were comparing it to that yeah. measuring stick that your dad gave you? Uh, I think it was more because I was comparing it to the me measuring stick that my MF, my MA in London gave me you know where i went yeah you know, i don't know if you've ever been you know representative of your people uh in a place you know i like like most people in america i have a very complicated relationship with being american you know i don't know i'm american but i'm also so many things you know because that's what america is but in london you know when i went to london for my masters and, and when i was a kid also in france i was american i was the representative of all americans and i had to answer <laughs> for america all the time and it gave me a real it was it was difficult because your complexity becomes sort of simplified into this thing, this this one aspect. And oh well, of course you'd say that you're American or you know whatever the stupid things people say you know all the time about whoever mm. always you know. So uh, the reason this this answers your question is because I think that being that sort of perennial outsider, uh, particularly in London in the in the early two thousands when the art scene was, you know. Um, High, con high highly conceptual you know very reduced of emotion it was extremely cerebral um and sort of facing this and also being who i am with my background and my and my upbringing i just it just didn't connect you know so i was never going to be that i was never going to be the high concept intellectual you know um lights turning off and on in a gallery kind of artist i would i was always going to fail at that so I think I extrapolated to that uh, to be art as a whole, you know, 
But again, I mean, it comes down also to, again to my perennial laziness. Like I just couldn't be bothered to apply myself <laughs> to that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I just was like, all right, there's so many other things to be done, you know. And mm. then and then to be perfectly honest, I mean, the Institute for Art and Olfaction, this nonprofit was in the beginning, uh, I considered it an arts practice. It was sort of so, social practice, they call it, you know, this idea that you can intervene in society as your art practice. But anyway, when you start talking about it, it sounds ridiculous, you know, so. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it sounds like a an interesting product, right? Like it's, it's, you know, everything is shaped and molded over time and it gets to be what it is. You mm. said that uh, art came easily to you, or at least more so than the other stuff. Do you think that's just because you had been doing it for a long time? Do you think that's why it came easy? I, I just think I had, I had a natural, I have and had a natural affinity to making something creative you know and and it never really like to say i had been doing it for a long time would imply that i had been sitting there like actually practicing my drawing which i wasn't you know it's just more that the impulse oh this is my little buddy my little i don't know if you can see her she's my little my little friend comes after school every day and waves at me she's eight <laughs> and very cute um sorry <coughs> i'm sorry I, I lost track what was the question Oh, uh, we're just talking about how art comes easy to you. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so yeah, it would imply that I, that I, it, it been... comes, the, 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 the creative impulse comes easy to me. I mean, it's something that it just naturally happens. I'm always thinking about things like, okay, how can you make something or how can you get that thing done? It's also a fine line between creativity and producing, you know, and I think producing is definitely something that I, I do very well. And I think that that is the flip side of creativity is production. <laughs> so. So I'm curious, you know, like you say you have a kind of a, a creative mind. I'm wondering if a lot of times when you're looking at something, do you have the idea of this is the way we've always done it, but why do we always do it this way? And I bet you there's a better way or a different way. Is that something that like has always been kind of in your nature? Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely to second guess those structures for sure. Yeah. A great example is in perfume. I mean, in perfume, in traditional French perfumery, which is not, you know, that's one iteration of perfume, how perfume has been expressed. But in that iteration, which happens to be sort of the dominant narrative in, in mainstream perfume, the idea that French perfume is the best perfume. Um, there's this idea that fragrances should be constructed with a top, middle, and a base. So a series of notes at the top that you smell right away and that they dissipate very quickly. A series of notes in the middle that you smell a little bit later and a series of notes at the, at the bottom, which last on your skin for the longest, you know, so it's this three X structure. Um, and the truth is that that's just one structure among many. And just because that's what they say should be done doesn't mean that it's actually true. For instance, in, in film, you know, or in, in books or writing, you know, you also have the three X structure oftentimes. But in film and books and writing and things like that, you know, more people are engaged with it. So people have picked it apart and, and poked at it. And so you get to, to, to expressions of the genre that are completely non-traditional. And, and that, quite, that hasn't quite happened in perfumery yet, but that impulse to sort of be like, well, this is how it's done, but why is it done that way? And is that the only way? Probably not. That definitely is something that comes naturally to me. You know, I, I'm always... You know, a friend once told me there's no authority that I that I can that I don't want to knock down, and it's true. I have a problem with authority, you know, <laughs> and and that's how it manifests. You know, it's like, well, just because you say that doesn't mean it's true. You know, I mean, you're an authority, but that doesn't mean that this other person's insights aren't valid. You know, and in perfume, it manifests as sort of a Eurocentric approach versus a historic and a global approach. For instance, American uh, Native tribes in the U.S work with scent for, 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 you know, centuries, right? And they don't engage in it in this top middle base composition structure like the French do. Is that less valid? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, it's just as valid. So whose authority are we respecting and why? You know, that's what, that's what I always want to know. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot of that comes down to um, people like what they like and you don't get to decide that, right? The French, perfume industry doesn't get to decide that you know it's like you and until people are introduced to these new things how are they going to know if they like it or not i was talking to totally. um, some musical artists the other day and they said um the future is not in doing the same thing that everybody's been doing 
over and over. Right. The future is in inventing new sounds and coming up with new music, you know, that's like so different than what we've done before. And I, I mean, I see the same thing. It sounds like that's a thread that runs through everything you talk about. Like just because we've done it this way doesn't mean we need to. And it's, it's funny that that seems to kind of wind through uh, a lot of your thought processes on stuff. I like that. I like well, it. I like a lot of creative that... practices in general. Like, I, I mean, I think probably a musician, an artist, a, a writer could all say the same, you know, these things need to be examined and pushed forward. Otherwise you're just doomed to repeat yourself over and over as your, as your musician friend said. So, you know, it's, um, you have to push through, you have to, you have to challenge it. You have to pick it apart. And, you know, eventually, you know, if you and I do our jobs, right, Greg, they're going to be picking us apart. You know, that's, that's the trajectory, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, prog that's how society evolves, you know, and it's, it's necessary, I think, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. something else you said that's interesting to me is kind of the open source nature of what you're trying to do. Like, And so I work in um, uh, IT. I work for a software company, but we're an open source software company, oh, which ultimately okay. means every bit of code, every line, every, you know, every piece of intellectual property we create, we put up on the internet for anybody to use. They don't have to pay us a dime if they don't want to. But, you know, there is value in coming to us as kind of the creators of this stuff. And um it's sort of, it's not just an ethos or they call it a culture, but it's really something that you, at some point, start feeling kind of down to your bones, right? Like that, it's like this information that I gather over time, it's so much better if I share it, you know, kind of the amplification, you know, that we're yeah. greater than the sum of our, uh, some of our parts, you know, the whole yeah. is. And so I'm just curious, like where the idea of gathering all this stuff and you know, just like making it free, <laughs> like this open exchange of ideas, especially in an industry that's traditionally so closed. It's like, yeah. how did you decide to do that? Because I know I've seen before when people do that, they tend to get a lot of hate. You know, it's like uh, you're, uh, you know, if you're a magician, you're not supposed to uh, reveal, divulge the secrets, you know? Oh, totally. And, and okay. Well, first of all, you know, I, I perfume, I came to, you know, my thirties. So I, uh, I came to perfume with with an interest in independent practices in media and and that of course you know at the time was all about you know multi multi um, platform storytelling so it really interacted a lot with software developers and so a lot of what i came, brought to perfumery i learned from people like you you know what i mean people who are either in software development or are software de development adjacent who then made it into filmmaking and storytelling so two people in particular uh really influenced me. One is a person called Jamie King, who's um, not to describe him except for, for he's sort of a digital pirate, you know, so he was very <laughs> early on involved with the P2P, um, you know, open sort of file share type stuff. Got very in involved with, you know, cryptocurrencies and all that early, but he, he hired me for a bit to, to work for him. He's a friend, you know, so it's always fun working for my friend. <laughs> it was awesome, actually, but he hired me to help him um, find filmmakers for this system that he had set up called Voto. And Voto was this idea that, look, you know, people are going to pirate your films, your content, no matter what you do. You know, this is, the future is open source. You know, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Just admit it, accept it, and, and, and make the best out of it by creating this. In his case, he created a platform where people would, would go through the platform, get all this stuff for free, and make donations. You know, it was sort of relying on the milk of human kindness. And it worked pretty well, actually, for a while. So that's Jamie. And then Lance Weiler, another film sort of multi-platform storytelling guy uh, based in New York, uh, always, you know, he was sort of a mentor for a while. And he always said, hey, Saskia, you know, information wants to be free. You can't own that stuff. You can't own information. Eventually, <laughs> it's going to get out, you know. So again, why, you know, you can sit there and hang on with your cold, dead hands to a dying structure, or you can just accept it, embrace it, and and find structures to survive within it i mean it's just pragmatic you know so so you like you said you know you guys have your your stuff open source and you get some something trickles back to you right i mean marketing or goodwill or whatever it is that stuff has value you know so the whole thing i'm doing, trying to do with perfume and actually i'm doing a phd about this the the idea of power and access in perfumery and and trying to apply open source principles to an industry that is not open source and that doesn't have the ip law to protect or support open source because you can't copyright a fragrance formula. Hmm. You know, the best you can do is patent the process by which you come to one of these synthetic chemicals, you know? 
and you can trademark branding and stuff like that. But the perfume formula themselves, the, the code, as it were, of, of any given perfume is unprotectable. So what they do, what they revert to is sort of this like putting under lock and key, you know, in a safe somewhere. But even that's fallacious because you can get any perfume bottle and you can run it through a GCMS and it'll tell you what chemicals are in there. So it, it's, it's just it's like this big, ridiculous situation where everyone's trying to protect knowledge that isn't protectable. And also, who cares? You know, you can't someone can reverse engineer your perfume. OK, but they don't have the capacity or the or the creative talent or whatever to do it themselves. So that's what you have. You have the capacity to create. That's really the only thing of value. The rest is it comes and it goes, you know? Um, well, to me, it seems like like the the old way of thinking, like where you're going to hide it behind lock and key, that's only going to last so long. And if you want to escape that, you would have to be constantly innovating. I guess that's that's the piece, right? You don't want to have to try and reinvent the wheel over and over. You just want to keep producing the exact same thing and have people love it and keep purchasing it. But as soon as that information yeah. gets out, then you, oh, oh no, now I have to start innovating again. And right, right, exactly. And I think, I mean, the, the hmm. cynical people in my industry are, are like, well, that's exactly it. And, you know, that's why the fragrances that come out are so unoriginal because, the, you know, forget innovation. We're just going to rehash the same stuff that we're holding on to over and over. And, and it works, you know, and they make money and it's a big industry, but it's not, it's like one of those things that isn't going to, it's not going to sustain itself long-term. So that, that idea of having to actually think creatively is difficult for a multinational corporation, you know, in fairness, you know, it's easy for me. I'm by myself here in my studio and you, you know, you're running your podcast or whatever, but when you have like thousands and thousands of people and paychecks and shareholders and yeah. stuff, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's complicated. So I understand that, you know, and I, and I empathize with that, but Nevertheless, you know, change is coming. You got to yeah. get with it. Yeah. And it's always, it's always the small radicals that uh, initiate the change. You know, the, uh, uh, I like to say the agents of chaos like yourself that, uh, you know, eventually uh, show that it is, uh, I guess, scalable or it is something that people are interested in want. And then once they see the light, then they'll uh, jump, uh, jump on the bandwagon. Do you think that's uh, coming in the yeah, future? Yeah, I mean... One of the reasons that I made the Institute a nonprofit is because I wanted to show that you could be a nonprofit and survive. You know, um, it doesn't have to be all about profits and, and hanging on to knowledge, you know, until you're dead. You know, it, you can be generous and you can share and you can foster community and you can encourage other people's practices and survive. That was the point. You know, um, that was the point of the Institute was like, watch, watch. You, can, you think you think that's the only way. There's another way, you know. And so, so, I mean, I, you know, I'm not the only person working on this. I don't want to take any credit. You know, there's plenty of people who are also working on this. But one of the reasons I'm proud of the Institute is because we have survived. It's been 10 years. We're doing well. You know, um, it's we're fine, you know, and, and we're not mega rich, but we don't need to be mega rich. You know, we have what we need to get by. And mm. that, that's OK, you know. So this year marks 10 years, right? It does. Yeah. Did you yeah. did you ever have any doubt that you were going to last this long, that you would make it to the 10 year mark? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I thought that far ahead. I don't think I ever <laughs> think that far ahead. I think I was just always in it. You know, you just get through it day by day. And then before you know it, you're there. There were definitely a couple of moments where I was fed up, but I was going to quit. And I was like, forget this. I can't handle this. <laughs> because, you know, look, you're working in the perfume industry and you're getting some some personalities. You know what I mean? It's 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 always people that end up bumming you out the most. But people, people, especially in independent practices, I think people are so they're struggling so hard. You know, really, people are struggling so hard for survival that it brings out the worst in people. People get a little crazy, you know, and I was like, OK, like, <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't I can't handle sort of the, the ramifications of everyone's suffering is is a bummer, you know. Um, and also, you know, sometimes, you know, at 2 a.m. when I can't sleep and I'm like, what am I, what is this all about? Like, what? you know, <laughs> what? perfume, who cares, you know, who cares about perfume? But I try to remind myself, it's not, it's not perfume, it's, it's the creative impulse, you know, it's, it's the idea that we have we have the right to access creativity um, in whatever form it takes. So I try to remember the bigger picture when I, when I lose motivation, you know, mm. yeah. what, uh, what gives you like the fist pump? Like when you, 
you do something? Is it when you, I'm assuming at some point, whenever you were able to blend certain scents together and you made something amazing, that was probably like a, an amazing feeling, but is it still there for you in that fashion or is it moved on to like whenever you see, see your students come in and when you see that light bulb kind of come on, is that where you get your satisfaction nowadays? Like what's... I get a lot of satisfaction from, from, you know, conversely the misery and the, and the greatest joy always comes from the people. So for sure, <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of joy that happens that I witness, you know, I mean, people really, that's one thing about smell that's that's cool is that it breaks down barriers you know it sounds cheesy but it's true you know people come into the space where i am here from all walks of life you know i mean people who would never ever interact in normal circumstances and they're in here and there's like eight of them and by the end of the night everyone's sniffing each other's arms and everyone's all close and and, and <laughs> everyone's sharing stories and it just really brings people together and it gives a really good vibe and that gives me a fist pump moment for sure uh, i've been trying lately to get back into the practice because you know you end up just doing so much administration you know mm. um that most of my existence you know has been the last couple of years has been producing and just making phone calls and answering emails and just stuff like that so i'm really trying to make time for myself to actually work with this work with the aromatics you know <laughs> like the thing that i was first in a way interested in um, yeah yeah, yeah, I was wondering, you know, because once it turns into a business, you you do all the parts that you don't like anymore and you save yeah. the parts that were fun for everybody else. And Exactly. How are you how exactly. are you refilling your cup these days? Well, I'm doing a PhD, you know, I'm doing a lot of research and that's really I'm enjoying that. So I'm I'm sort of getting into the more into the history of, of the perfume industry and sort of understanding why it came to be the way it is. Um, and that's I'm getting a real I'm really enjoying that. That's that refills my cup. But also just literally blending materials, together, blending aromatics. You know, the thing that I, I was first curious about, which is like, well, what happens when you add a soy super and methyl cyclopentan, whatever, these chemicals together, what does that smell like? That also, I think I've been, I've been really trying to focus on a bit for myself personally, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to the practice and the work. Hmm. You know? I saw, I was, you know, stumbling around on, on Google and I saw some Atlas Obscura stuff coming up. And so you do some online courses too then, huh? Yeah. Well, when COVID happened, you know, obviously <laughs> in person smelling is impossible because masks are off and people, you know, you have to get up close and personal. So mm -hmm. the Institute, my, my nonprofit went almost entire, went entirely online for about a year and a half. Uh, now we're back to in person, but in, in doing the online in addition to online, but in doing the online classes, um, you know, we developed a really good system for it. Uh, and so Atlas Obscura asked uh, us to develop courses for them, which I've been doing and teaching uh, for, for gosh, since 2000, 2021, mid, mid 2021 now. So yeah, they've been great. I mean, it's a whole new community of people and their, their Atlas Obscura community tends to be curious and you know, open and interested. And so it's, it's a really, it's a really cool crew. They're, they're good people that come to these classes. I really enjoy it, but it's entirely online, which is um, both awesome and, and can be a bummer too. You know, mm. do you feel, um, I mean, what's the feeling associated with it? Like I, I definitely have uh, specific feelings cause I do uh, a lot of online education and then I, mm -hmm. I'm just now getting to do some in-person stuff. So I have definite opinions on it. I'm just curious what um, you say. It's not, not quite the same. What's what feels missing to you? Well, I mean, there's the obvious thing in that there's something very, one of the reasons that I was attracted to working with smell also in the beginning was, you know, I was going through all this content. I was working at this TV network, just constantly churning through content, you know, as they call it now, you know, Mm -hmm. people's creative impulse that becomes content just turning and burning and there's something about <laughs> smelling uh and smelling with the person where you're in that moment and you're in your physicality and you just cannot digitize that you know that is something that just you have to be there and it's nice it's nice so i miss that in terms of the online education but what i've found is that you know if i'm sitting here smelling my rose you know and you're sitting there in texas smelling the rose we can still share that moment together as long as we have the same rose you know right. so so that's sort of what has worked out is that 
I found that actually you can still connect with people really, really, really well and really intimately um, through Zoom, you know, uh, while you're smelling the same thing and having your reactions because the talking is the talking translates, you know, it, you can digitize that. So, um, yeah. So and then the thing I really like about online education is that it doesn't ask the same amount from me as in person does f from a very simple perspective. I could be having a terrible day. I could be wearing my pajamas. You know, I could be a total mess and it doesn't necessarily translate through through Zoom, you know. <laughs> um, so in a way, it's sort of like it's a little bit it's not anonymous, but it's a little anonymous. And I, I kind of like that, you know. Um, and I think most educators I know who deal a lot with, you know, people um, have, have said the same, that they kind of, it, it's a little less demanding in a way. Um, so for me, that's a bit of a relief, you know, although it does also mean that it's a little less connected. Mm. You know? I don't know. Do you feel the same way? Uh, for me, well, I don't know. I, I've gotten accustomed to doing all this stuff. So I've done some, I'm an author for LinkedIn learning. So I, I create a bunch of courses and I never see faces when I do that. I create that right. content, it goes up and people just watch videos. But then um, I will do online workshops and things like that. And I'm staring at a bunch of black squares. Nobody ever turns their camera on. That, that I don't like, that's a bummer. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's one thing. I mean, I really try to insist that people turn their damn cameras, yeah. excuse me, their darn cameras on because that, that staring at a bunch of black squares is actually kind of depressing. It's, yeah. it really, I don't know, you're just screaming into the void and my workshops and, and, are usually And they don't like get anything out of it either, actually. Five or six hours. Yeah, right. Because, you know, if you're not on camera, then you're just watching your phone. You're spacing out. You're yeah, doing totally. the, yeah. 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 So. You got to be in it to win it, right? Yeah. So yeah. that definitely, that definitely pulls from me because it doesn't matter how animated I get or what, you know what I mean? It's like, there's still, there's just nothing coming back. There's no feedback. There's you no know? connection. Yeah, <laughs> you know? there's nothing. You can make that's... a joke and, and it's like, you know. Silence, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's uh, it for that's, me. That's about me. When I do it in person, I do. I see all these faces. I see immediate engagement and it changes the way I teach. You know, exactly. I will yeah. I will instantly see if somebody gets a concept or if they don't. And I'm constantly saying dumb things and, uh, you know, making jokes and, you know, you develop a rapport. And to me, it's almost like in person, when they see who I am, they get a sense of me. They start to trust me in a way that they never would over a Zoom call, over one of these things, you know? I, 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 like you said a minute ago, I make a human connection. Yeah, and yeah. I can feel that as much as I can see it landing on them. And so it's just, to me, it's so different. Yeah. Um, it is a necessary tool. and. I'm happy we have it. And <laughs> I mean, it definitely kept me employed for uh, all of COVID. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not. But I mean, when people it. have the cameras on on Zoom and you're seeing them react, it's a little better, right? I mean, yeah, it helps. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think for me, the online education has worked because for me, you know, because I, I, I bloody well insist. Yeah. I'm like, I'm sorry, guys. Like, I need to see you because also with smelling, like, there's so much emotion that comes in people's yeah. faces. And, oh, you know, that's yeah. my excuse. Yeah. Oh, no. I, a hundred percent. It's just like, so I in software and yeah. it's like enterprise Different. software. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of neurodivergent people in there that yeah, 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 yeah. honestly, yeah. they're so much more comfortable that you, so it's like, it's hard for me yeah, to like, yeah. Oh, I'll shame them. I'll shame them all day. And then I'll get yeah. a few cameras in there. Cause like, if I get one camera on, I'm like, Oh, thank you to whoever this guy is or, or that <laughs> gal. And yeah. appreciate you turning that camera on. And then all of a sudden I'll get 25% of them to turn on. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. So. That's, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. I think I think for the, the things that I teach, it tends to be very much based on emotions and memories, and you know, at least that's what people come to perfumery with. It's like, oh, it's so linked to memory, and so it, it, it's a self-selecting group of people who are ready to talk about memories and emotions, and typically they'll they'll want to be seen, you know. So yeah. maybe it's um, maybe I've been more fortunate, you know. Um, and that's that's sort of the subject that really excited me about being able to talk to you is kind of that connection between. Um, feeling and memory and smell because it seems to be so much quicker and more visceral for me like when mm -hmm. i smell something like that memory pops like i'm not like i'm a, sometimes i'll immediately feel that thing not just i'll remember the situation and then the memories will come sometimes it's like the feeling almost first there. which yeah. is weird um 
So yeah. I was just curious, like you must have done some exploration with that or had some For time sure. with that. And I was just curious your thoughts on it. Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's like I'm actually pulling up a, a slide from one of my talks, but I can't find it. But, there, there, you know, there's a biological reason why sense is linked to memory. And it's, you know, to, to summarize and, and sort of, you know, simplify it, it's the part of our brain that processes smell isn't the part of our brain that processes rational language. You know, it's the part of our brain that processes um, learned response and memory. <laughs> so or at least it's it's linked to or closer to that part of the brain, you know? Um, so so point is that it is fundamental to smell is that it triggers memory, you know? Uh, but to my, to my, for my money, I would also say that so does music, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know, it's hard because I've worked with smell now for 10 years that, you know, I have, I'll have scent memories associated with certain materials that relate back to projects I was doing at the Institute at the time <laughs> with that material. It's not very poetic though. You know what I mean? My, my, my more poetic memories with smell have, have been obliterated, I think by these new memories that I'm, I'm that are more work related with the smells, but um, actually I, it's funny. There, there's a, there's a, there's a group in, in the perfume world called the Tisserand Institute and they do a lot of education around health and safety with essential oils and, I was doing a workshop the other day and the head of that group, uh, Robert Tisserand, um, came up to me after the class and he said, you know, because we were talking about memories and emotions. And he's like, you know, Saskia, I, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I don't have any more memories or emotions that come up with these smells. Like I smell myrrh and I'm not thinking, oh, a church in the Baltic. I'm thinking myrrh. You know? <laughs> and I was like, this is one of the things that happens when you work with smell is that poetic sort of um, that... I don't know what Jaron Lanier calls the loopy bits, you know, like the, the bits that are a little bit less linear uh, mm. or, or quantifiable get get sort of pushed aside. Um, so that's a very, very long answer. But the point is that memory and scent are hugely connected. Most people get have extremely strong emotional responses to certain smells. And it's and it's more than just like, oh, that reminds me of this time where I was at the beach with my mother in 1978. It's, it's, oh, I feel how I felt that moment. So that's why it's also linked to emotion, you know? And it happens to me periodically. Like once in a blue moon, I'll get like, oh my gosh, that thing. But less, less often than it used to, unfortunately. Mm. But what can still do it for me is music. Like if I listen to the Fugees, what's that album from the mid nineties, you know? Um, I, I, I go straight back to what I was going through at that time. Um, because it's re it's retained a bit of its mystery music for me you know versus smell that's interesting it makes you wonder uh, you know that uh, the idea that you were saying that <clears throat> sometimes the smells will take you back to just you know being in the lab working on stuff so do you think you could on purpose create kind of a, a sense memory like so like anytime you do something you know that's particularly enjoyable you introduce this, this certain smell and then you know if you're having just a low day you could introduce that smell to yeah well, yeah. Certainly people have tried. I mean, there's also people who have really engaged with scent and memory very systematically. Um, like, for instance, Andy Warhol, actually, <laughs> every three months, you know, he, I don't know if this is urban legend or truth. But I think there's truth to it. <laughs> they say that every three months, um, or maybe it was every year, he, he wore one perfume and then he put it in a box. And that was, he only wore it for that period of time. And then when he wanted to trigger that memory, he'd go to the box and he'd smell the perfume. And so he was sort of intentionally um hacking into the scent memory connection to for his own purposes i also know i know i know an artist called devin bauer bauer b-a-u-r i always forget how to pronounce her last name but devin bauer um did a project where she um was doing just that where she was trying to create a scent memory uh with this one installation that she did but at the end of the installation the people are are given a certain smell and that is meant to lock that memory in for the future. Hmm. So certainly with a little strategy and practice, I think you could easily do that. And the best example I can give also in the real world of people who've done that is the actors, you know, sometimes actors will use smell when they're studying their lines in order to get into character to remember the lines. So they'll just spray that perfume when they're in that character, for instance. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really Magic. are. You really are Magic. into the history part of this. I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> So I was, you know, like through my, my digging around, I saw you guys have the Art and Olfactory Awards that you started, which to me is really interesting. And then I was seeing that 
it's uh, it, like it's going to be announced the winners at the Perfumery Congress or no World Perfumery Congress. I was wondering if you could talk about those two things a little bit because they both sound pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, they are interesting. They're bizarre. So the World Perfume <laughs> Congress is what my friend uh, Luca Turin called the Davos of perfumery. So it's sort of a summit every four years where all the heads of industry come together and discuss the industry, you know, so you know, anything from like talks and, and workshops and things like that, but mostly it's big multinational corporations showcasing uh, new technology. So new aromatic molecules that they've developed um, or whatever. So last one I went to was in, in Nice in France. And this one is in Miami, which is a little easier to get to and closer to home. Uh, and so the art and olfaction awards are sort of the opposite end of the spectrum in that we're the awards are a pr program that we produce the institute produces uh, that is meant to it, celebrate independent perfumery uh, and experimental perfumery so rose the world perfume congress is sort of very industry facing so it's really mainstream really high octane money and business and all that you know publicly traded companies and whatnot the awards are, you know, what I hope they are, what I try to make them is touchy feely, down home, super familial, super open, absolutely unpretentious, completely accessible to independent practitioners. So they're, they're, they're in complete opposition to, to one another, these two entities. But having said that, <laughs> this year, the, the World Perfume Congress, um, the people who produce it, the American Society for Perfumers, and then an entity called Perfumerist and Flavorist Magazine, invited us to have the awards at the Congress. I, I think um, in the interest of sort of creating connections between the two segments of the of the industry, as it were. So it's sort of like what I what I like to sort of equate it to is like the Oscars versus Sundance Film Festival. You know what I mean? The Oscars are, you know, they're they're very uh, heavily landscaped movies, you know, and heavily landscaped stars, and it's all very consumer friendly. Whereas Sundance, you know, at least in its original iteration, was was rougher. It was more rough. It was independent. It was it was there were some more singular visions in there, you know. So, so it's sort of like a merging of those two, um, or a collaboration between those two entities, but in the perfume world, I think is the best way of describing it. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I, I think my whole crew. I mean, we're all pretty artsy, you know. And we're going to show up and I think we're all going to be a little like, okay, what are we doing here? But it's going to be fun, you know? And I think it does the people that we're celebrating a favor to, to have the awards within this massive Congress, because what it does is it promotes visibility for independent practices and it shows, you know, the corporate, the, the multinational corporations and the, you know, mainstream perfume industry that there's value in these independent practices and that they bring something to the equation. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if maybe viable. would they use these uh, awards as kind of um, a headhunting opportunity, maybe, or maybe opportunities possibly. for collaboration? I mean, for collaboration, possibly. I could see that being valuable. I mean, the, the perfume industry is is doesn't need us. You know what I mean? Like, they don't need the independents. Generally speaking, the only way the independents could interact with the industry is either they use one of the fragrance houses to compound or make the actual perfume. Um, but that they will only do that with really high quantities of production. So, mm. for instance, if I had a perfume brand, I would produce maybe, let's say, a thousand bottles a year or something like that. We're talking, you know, quantities of like, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 bottles a year. So the quantities are too low for the perfume industry to be so interested in. But I think I think there's there's a definite awareness within the industry that, you know, things need to change. Things are changing. If only for representation, I mean, it's a very Eurocentric industry, you know, so if only because like you can't look around the boardroom and see a bunch of, you know, no offense to our poor beleaguered white dudes, but we can't see a bunch of like old white dudes like around the boardroom for much longer. Like this is this has this is changing, you know, so if anything, I think it's a great opportunity for them to see potential new faces and potential new collaborators that can help facilitate and make the change easier for them because it's hard, mm. I think, you know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> or new ideas, you know. I don't know. Yeah. So describe the people at um, the Perfumery Congress. Is it mostly like business types, or is it like yeah. mostly artsy people, or mostly business? No. Yes. Uh, that's a bunch um, of suits. That sounds. Boring. Yeah, and, and and you know, you know, there's a there's a whole diversity of 
a type of person who wears a suit. You know, I mean, there's there's amazing people and and people who are extremely creative, but 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 it's definitely in the context of business. So the bottom line, you know, at the end of the day is money, you know, and no matter how you like to hide that, that's the truth. So, and then, and then the crew that I bring or that I represent is, I mean, <laughs> no money, <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Like it's, I don't know what people are motivated by, but it, it's not money. So it's, it's just two different approaches to what, what art is, you know, is it a business or is it a creative impulse that we just engage in because that's what humans do. Hmm. Um, so and and the, hopefully there's a connection. Most of yeah. the people that are uh, competing in the Art Olfactory Awards, do they, I mean, do they have kind of like small shops where they produce scents? Yeah, or? yeah. I mean, it can, it can range anywhere from like, you know, a person literally in their kitchen, you know, who just makes something really good. To um, to you know a small an independent brand um, that's a little bit more hip and uh, not I should, hip is the wrong word but a little more public or a little bit more um, has has more let's say sales channels you know what I mean then mm -hmm. so so but but we we limit our up our um, upper limit of people who can participate are are brands that are owned by another brand with no more than four companies or four perfume companies in their holdings so that basically cuts out any brand that's owned by Estee Lauder, owned by LVMH, owned by um, Coty. You know, there's there's these massive sort of perf umbrella perfume brand holders that own a lot, like anything from Fenty Beauty to Kat Von D. You know, all these things are owned by a parent corporation. And that's that's what I mean by the multinational companies. Um, yeah. So we, we don't we don't allow them to participate. That's they're too big, you know. Yeah, it's cheating. So you really want more independent, more kind of grassroots DIY sort of folks. Yeah, I mean, what, what you know, I, I, for, I formed the awards based on my experience running that film festival we spoke about earlier, the Silver mm -hmm. Lake Film Festival. And the idea was that, you know, every independent creative impulse needs a place to, to support it, to promote it, to help bring it forward, to help present it to the world. Um, just artists need that kind of support. You know, it's just, it's like a gallery or a museum or, you know, or I don't know, whatever, a radio station that's playing independent music. Like you just need that sort of amplification, I guess, is the word people are using now. So that's what the awards are meant to do. They're just meant to amplify independent, experimental, and, and sometimes quite singular voices, things that would never succeed in mm -hmm. the mainstream context, you know. What does it do for you to see all those people come together and you get to actually meet and interact with them? Like, how does it's, that, how is that for you? It, it's, it's dope. And it's dope because it's super international. So you get all sorts of people from all over the world. I really, really like that. I like the, I like the global connections. I mean, that's something that I, that fills my cup, you know, to use the mm -hmm. term you, you mentioned earlier. I like seeing people from all over the world connecting over something. It makes me happy. You know, I, I really enjoy it. And I like connecting with people that I have nothing to do with, that have nothing to do with my culture, and that I totally don't get their culture. There's always something you can find, you know? And I feel like what I get out of the awards are those moments where you see, you know, these two kids, from, these two like 20 year olds from Malaysia on stage, you know, next to a German creative director uh, <laughs> and, and connecting over the same thing, you yeah. know, and having a real conversation about it. I love that. Mm. And it's all, all these people come together, the sharing of thoughts. I mean, for me, like finding community was a really big thing. And I'm, I'm sure it's pretty difficult to find community in this, in this kind of, uh, I guess, the indie part of the industry, at least. And all that's coming together because you decided you wanted to do this. You wanted to take a risk. You want to take a chance to put this together. That's yeah, pretty I mean, freaking you know, phenomenal. It's cool. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not the only one. Like there's some. Um, right. There's a, there's a website called Base Notes um, that was started by this guy, Grant Osborne, uh, in the early 2000s that, that you know, there, there, there were seeds that led to the Institute. Um, and thank God I'm not the only one because that's, that's a lot of, it's a lot of pressure if I were, you know, but there's a lot of micro communities happening. But, but when I started the Institute, there were, you know, there was an online community, but I, I don't know, it just, it didn't feel like something that I could really 
Well, first of all, I, I should say that, you know, on the internet, everything terrible and everything great happens, right? But and in the perfumery <laughs> world, it's no different. So the online community could, or I should say one iteration of the online community could get a little bit, for lack of a better word, bro -y, you know, like a little like, yo, this is a great panty dropper, you know, that kind of crap, you know, which obviously <laughs> is something that I like, I don't know, you know, how can you engage with that? You know, I couldn't. <laughs> so I felt like at least, at least the Institute created a community that I, it's my community. Like I like it, you know, it's, right. it's my people. So yeah. it, it's, it's, it's a community that I like. So selfishly, that's the main thing I think that the Institute brought me at least is, is that the good mm. people. Yeah, I've done that exact opinion. same thing in my life. But you know yeah. what's funny is you kind of you sort of downplayed your position in all of this, you know, and and there may have been people that um, helped before and maybe people that will help after or during. But, you know, it's like when you line up a bunch of dominoes, if you pull one of those out, everything stops right there. In the Right. So it's like your contribution is just as important pushing it forward. And I think. Sure. But it's not the only one, you know. No, it stands but, alongside the other dominoes. And each one is important, right? <laughs> and each one is important. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, that. the thing that's important to clarify also is that I built the Institute based on the idea that this is a mechanism that needs to be and should be replicated. So I built in, I, I, I intentionally, although sometimes I lose sleep over this, okay, I'm going to be perfectly honest, but, the <laughs> but what I, I intended this to be a mechanism that is that is replic re replicable and therefore carries the seeds of its own destruction, you know? Uh, and that's based on the open source, you know, sort of mm -hmm. principles that, that inform what I brought to this, which is that you need to do your part, but you need to understand that your part is gonna be built upon and part of building upon means destroying. That's just how it goes, you know? Progress is a little bit of destruction, so. I lose sleep over it sometimes because it's it's in our nature as humans to get very attached to what we've built. You know, you just, uh, I don't know, it, it's your baby, you know, and you can't handle the idea of it being copied or whatever. But that's the whole point, you know. So the reason I'm saying, no, we're not the only one is because, like, we're not, nor should we be, you know. We should we should be one part among among tons. And I'm happy to say that, you know, since I started the Institute, there's you know, there's like a similar thing in Berlin, Smell Lab, run by my friend Clara Ravat. There's one now in Glasgow called the Library of Olfactive Materials. Um, there's there's a bunch. There's a bunch of similar uh, institutions or organizations that are that are being formed um, to do exactly what we do in their own way and to build on that community. So eventually, I can not do it anymore. <laughs> I was hard. wondering if you could imagine a day where something else lights a fire under your butt. You know, and you really get passionate about something. Could you, is there, can you imagine a day where you say, you know what, I've, I've taken this as far as I can and it's, it's time for you guys to, to pick up and move. I'm going I, over I here. Can, I can definitely imagine that day. Yeah. Because, because I think that day is coming for me. You know, I've been doing this for 10 years. It's a nonprofit. I've lost, you know, I've lost sleep. I've lost, I've got gray hairs. I've got, ring, you know, it's, it's hard work, man. And I'm, yeah. you know, I'm 43 and. You just get to a point where you're like, okay, you know, like let the 20 year olds take over and that's cool. And I think that the principles that led me to start the Institute are the principles that are going to lead me to start whatever the next thing is, mm. but not quite yet. I think I have another couple of years left. Yeah. I have, to, I have a couple of projects I want to finish, like an open source library um, where all I want to do a project actually as a software person, you might understand this in a way that most people won't. So I want to do a project where everybody that has a singular library of, of smells, of aromatic objects, even of books. Anything that relates to smell enters the data into like a public shared database. And we have an interconnected web of, of smell libraries, you know? So the whole world is connected through this web of libraries uh, that relate to smell objects. I'm not doing a good job pitching this, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a database, open source database project that involves people who are collecting micro collectors or artist collectors to, to upload all their information about their collection and create sort of a, a global collection of scent objects. Um, I don't know, it, to me, it's like, it's a really cool project. You know. And by scent objects, you mean like once you've combined X, Y, then it turns out you get this kind of Z thing, like that kind no, of No, no, I mean like, okay, so you're in Texas and you have a collection of 45 perfume bottles that you got from your, your mother mm -hmm. from the 60s or whatever. 
And I'm in California and I have a collection of 85 books, you know, that relate to smell. So you upload all your data on your perfume objects, you know, and I relate all the data on my books and then we create connections. So this book refers to this perfume X from 1962 that you happen to have in your collection. So it's sort of like a, a massive amount of hyperlinks, like a spider web of hyperlinks, if you know what I mean. Where, and then and then they also relate to, to stories, to memories that, so Greg, you know, you have a memory of the grass from when you were 17 on a field with your brother's Camaro, you know, and you write, up, upload that memory, you know, and that Camaro links to a perfume that was inspired by a Camaro, you know what I mean? So it's just a massive <laughs> connection of different sort of knowledge and emotions yeah. and memories that humans have around smell. I can dig Have it. I that's, it? <laughs> no, that's pretty interesting. Like to me, like mm, I love, uh, I love uh, like big data analysis and stuff like that. And so the idea of having a book that would cross reference to a fragrance. So if I want to do more research on it, I could instantly, you know, boom, and it would start showing me all these connections to these various things that I could go. Yeah, and research. it would pull up like the perfume photo object, yeah. you know, that you put up, and then that would perf- pull up the name of the perfumer, and you know, whatever the the yeah, top that's pretty cool. It's all that stuff. Yeah, it, it, that's, that's, I'm working on this with my friend Anna, who's a, who's sort of um, she like she worked for Google Creative Lab. She's like one of these digital storyteller uh, geniuses, you know. And so she understands the technology part way better than I do, you know, but what I, what I'm excited about is the idea of this web of memories and emotions that, that are engaged with through the lens of smell, you know? Um, Yeah. I think that's interesting because it's not just, it's not just the information piece, like the nuts and bolts, the, you know, no, no. It's this object be. connects that. It's actually the human, the memory. It's the, the, it's the emotions. Yeah, it's the soft, it's the squishy part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, huh. I keep, I keep coming back to that Jaron Lanier thing. That the, the, the loopy bits. You know, he was referring to music, of course. Like, I think he was referring to MIDI versus real, um, in real life music playing, and and the MIDI, I think, just like goes from note to note in a linear fashion. But that sort of, you know, like the of. Um, <laughs> of that uh rhapsody in blue like you can't get that outside of a live experience the loopy bits you know Hmm. and to me those loopy bits are sort of metaphorical for memories and emotions and sort of what it is that connects people you know um and you can't really quantify that except through story i think so that's Hmm. why this whole thing will be story driven i think it's so funny the vast majority of people i end up talking uh, to on here end up being storytellers in one form or fashion. I have never in a million years thought of somebody telling me a story kind of through smell. That's, I mean, it's, it's fascinating and it makes so much sense. And it seems like I it would connect me like it, like if I could physically smell this at the same time that they're telling me the story, like I feel like that would just heighten my, cause I, I, I love hearing stories like that's, uh, some of my earliest memories are like of people telling me stories. And uh, yeah. so I could, yeah, I could definitely see that like intensifying my connection to somebody telling me something, just, you know, make it like a, a 4D experience sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And also discovering, how, you know, how, how, I mean, for me, the thing that informs it all, again, is this connection between people, like d- discovering how, what it is that brings us all together, you know? I mean, there's something you and I have in common, you know, Greg, like no matter what, you know, we may live in different places, be different, you know, genders or whatever, but there, there's definitely something in there that we have in common always, you know, and I, I love finding what out with that. That's just that that's what that's what I that's what I love that, you know, what is it that we all share like and why and it sounds Pollyanna, but like when you discover that it's really hard to rationalize hatred, mm. racism, war, because you're like, wow. Why would I do this to this person who's just like me? Because we both smell this thing or whatever. Yeah. We both have the same memory or, you know, it, it's, yeah, those connections are, are, are crucial, you know? Yeah. Heaven and forbid, dialogue. heaven forbid we find common ground. Heaven forbid you humanize me because then, you know, oh, no, you, you may not be able to hate me. The internet. <laughs> <laughs> What am yeah, I going to get mad about on Instagram, man? That's, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's definitely been uh, a big philosophy for me in life is, um, uh, or here, like my later in life is, is empathy. Like I, yeah. I don't hate anyone and I never get mad at anybody because yeah. there's always a reason, um, for why they're doing something, saying something, act a certain way. And I just don't see it, you know, yeah. and, and I don't understand it. And it's, 
and that's become my job is to to understand um at least for for me is like to understand the parts behind it it's like why well, uh, why do you do yeah. this why do you do that and what you're doing is you're not being lazy you know you're actually taking the time to think it through versus like oh i hate that person like that's lazy you know what i mean to be like oh they suck because whatever <laughs> oh oh you know that's like the, that's like the laziest thinking ever you know what i mean it's a lot harder to do what you're doing which is to be like okay well what's the reason or you know even if you don't ever know the reason uh, to imagine to, to like cast the imagination to the mm -hmm. fact that they may have a reason mm -hmm. is like it's like more work than 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 i think the internet at least lends itself to and i, I don't know i mean i think it's cool and, and i'm with you you know well, I, I for me it comes back to feeling it's like i don't like the way it makes me feel when that when you know if i'm angry at somebody angry. or whatever you know like i I don't like the way that sits inside me because it yeah. will it'll it'll sit on my chest for days sometimes but if i can just use a little bit of empathy just look through a different lens and understand a little bit or you know maybe feel bad a little bit or whatever it happens to be whatever the scenario you know whatever the situation requires that goes away and i don't have to feel that way anymore what's you know? the hardest person for you to empathize with um Oh man, um, uh, perfectly honest. Probably uh, uh, a male figure committing domestic abuse yeah. to me, and That's that just goes back to childhood trauma. Like it's 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 super tough for me to like find any common ground, or you know, with yeah. like, or to be uh, like, you know what, they're suffering. Well, but you know what, I have found in life is that um, hurt people hurt people, and yeah. so it's generally. Um, you know what I found is people don't choose to be assholes. You know right. what I mean? Like yeah. they don't go out of their way and wake up and say, "Man, I'm just going to be miserable be today." Yeah. To sauce, you know, just to yeah. whoever, anybody. You know, they just they don't choose that. It's yeah. they've been built that way over a lifetime, or you know, or certain events, really ones that I'm sure were very unfortunate. And I wouldn't wish on anybody. You know, so they've kind of earned those wounds. And so, yeah. trying to that doesn't mean I want to surround myself with those people. Right, <laughs> but it no, it course. helps me understand you know yeah. and 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 it helps you let go of the the anger yeah. that it manifests in you because it does right I mean, or yeah. it might give me an extra couple of seconds to say you know why do you feel that way why do you think that way yeah and try and just hear it and trace it back that's why like it fascinates me like how you want to burn down authority <laughs> you know how you want to rage against the machine it's curious to me where that came from like, because I'm sure there was something in there that. Well, I mean, you know, first of all, it's, it's a very Gen X, you know, thing. I'm like on the tail end of Gen X and the people that I looked up to as, as a kid, as a teenager were, you know, Rage Against the Machine, you know, Zach DeLaRue, you know, people who were like, you know, F the police, you know, whatever. There were people who manifested, you know, a questioning of authority in every single form of culture, you know, I mean, that was just what people did in that generation you know um we, we, so so there's that you know it's generational i think um is that kind also, of what you know, your dad did as well yeah for sure i mean my dad's mellow you know my dad's not angry he's just like whatever you know it's cool they can do their thing but i'm still gonna do, you know he, he doesn't have a problem with authority but um, he but he's definitely does his own thing but well, my he... mom <laughs> My mom is a real, she's a real firecracker, as they say, you know, she, she, <laughs> she was like expelled from Egypt, you know, in the sixties for binding her breasts and like crashing a party and getting drunk, you know, and she was expelled <laughs> from Lebanon for a similar reason. I mean, this woman misbehaved across, you know, <laughs> across many countries, you know, um, and she has a real issue with authority and she comes from, you know, pretty, I'll just say it, an upper class British family, you know, uh, and she was the black sheep. And in fact, I was, you know, I was born out of wedlock, you know, to, uh, sorry, I was born, I'm, I'm a bastard child to my mom's gasp. family. I know, gasp, right? <laughs> but I mean, that's the, that's the sort of space she came from. So she had good reason to be anti-authority. And so I think she instilled that constant mm. questioning. And also, you know, she was, was raised in the context of sort of French intellectualism of the 60s, which is existentialism and questioning everything and nothing has any actual meaning um except the the questioning you know the meaning oh philosophy that so. sounds very counter to british culture like women are totally. supposed to be seen <laughs> and not heard and, absolutely and yeah. my mom is definitely heard and quite annoying i mean i love her but she's 
bloody annoying, you know, but, but that's part of it. You know, it's like, you have to be, a, what is it? The squeaky wheel is, is squeaky, you know, it's, yeah. you want it to stop squeaking, but you're glad it squeaks, you know? So I think really I have to, my mom is definitely, um, She's also a strong character, so I, I was constantly rebelling against her authority, you know. So she just she's she's a tough woman, and she raised me to be pretty tough, you know. That's cool. Um, well, yeah. you know, and also like I look at your, I look at your pedigree, like all the things you've been doing over time, and those are all loud positions where you have to be authoritative. You have to say, "This is mine. This is my space," um, especially as a female in right. those spaces. Like to right, me, right, that right. said, you have a certain type of personality that's not going to take any shit from anybody. And I definitely don't take any shit, but I'm also extremely polite, and I and I and I oh, do find absolutely. that unlike my mother, I um, <laughs> excuse me, I do find that the best way of getting your way is being like as kind as possible, and 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 that's worked for me, you know, like just being as nice as possible and smiling and getting it done anyway. You know what I mean? I think so. I think that's 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 a different way that my mom than my mom did it where she was just like yelling and screaming <laughs> i'm simplifying a bit i mean she's a wonderful intelligent woman and she's complicated but she's so are you more just don't take no for an answer kind of person? i just smile through it and if there's a no and it's a no that's fine because there's all these other things you can do you know that are just as cool so just never stop i love it well something else I mean, we're coming up right here towards the end, but it seems like something you were probably pretty passionate about. So I thought I'd ask you is that you'd mentioned like, uh, and I try not to read too many like interviews with people and like, cause I want to, you know, I want to be surprised. I want to, I want to see it all in the moment, but you said something about like, if, you know, you were going to take somebody like in LA for a day, like show them places. One of the things you said is that you would take them to Skid Row to show them um, kind of the real side of some of that. And I was wondering why that was, I mean, because you were only taking people to like four places and that was one of them. So I was wondering why that was so important to you. Well, because I mean, how can we, <laughs> I mean, the, it, you have to be aware of the injustice, you know, I mean, it's it, especially a place like LA that's, well, I mean, any city, you know, you have the narrative of the city, the dreams of the city, you know, the mythology of the city and you have the reality of the city and the reality isn't like, you know, film noir and like you know murdered starlets it's like desperate poverty on the streets of the city and mostly frankly people of color like what's happening here you know so i don't know i mean it's not i i wouldn't bring them there out of a sense of sort of disaster porn i mean that's not what i'm trying to do but i i, I do think that you need to see <laughs> the reality of of especially people who come from different countries you know just let's look at the reality of of america you know it's a wonderful place. I love it. I love America. I'm proud. I, I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm proud to be an American. But uh, you <laughs> have to know that it's a complex, it's a complex place. And there's a lot to be proud of. And there's a lot that needs work. And so seeing that, I think, is crucial. Yeah. And, and being aware of what needs to, because then you can actually, but in being aware, you can start to at least try to, to make a change, you know, I mean. Yeah, but it's it's usually a pretty major bummer for people, you know. They're like, "Thanks for that. Can we just get a taco?" <laughs> I'm like, "No, you must see the poverty." <laughs> <laughs> Got to eat your vegetables first. Yeah, 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 totally. Just just be aware, you know. Be aware of what this is, and then and then and then see what you can do to actually be a responsible citizen or traveler or guest, you know. Um, yeah, but I also, do have this... I mean, it's bad here. The homelessness yeah. is bad, you know. I do have conversations with people every now and then about, you know, like especially my oldest, my oldest son, for whatever reason, he always wants to have this conversation about how crappy America is. And it's, it's so funny because he's growing up in like a middle class family in a nice yeah. area. And it's like, my fuck kid's the same. Yeah. yeah. And so, it, you know, it's like, you know, it may not, I don't know, you may only see the injustice sometimes, but I think that this is probably the best country doesn't mean we can't be better and we always can be better and we should be better. But you know what I mean? It's like, you can't completely ignore Look, some of the beauty in life. Jazz, you know, I mean, <laughs> it gave us, it gave us, you know, it gave us, I was about to say the taco, but that's, that's not true. <laughs> but it gave us so many things, you know, I mean, there's so many things that are beautiful about, and, and believe me, you know, I was, 
you know, I was I, I moved to London, like literally my flight was on 9-11. You know, I moved to London right Whoa. after 9-11. I had nothing but, oh, well, you guys got what you deserved. You know, look at America's policies. Wow. And I'm like, absolutely true. America's policies are absolute crap. Like we've mistreated the world for sure. But with due respect, so did you. You know, yeah. and like, and did you guys forget about colonialism? Is that yeah, totally? You know, I mean, what? and sorry, <laughs> you're German, like, what are you... <laughs> with respect, dude, you know, but so, so I had to really engage with what it means to be American, and it's been tough, you know, and and I should say, neither of my parents are American, you know, so but I've come to the conclusion, like, this is a place that gave us some very beautiful things, New Orleans jazz you know um the hot dog i don't know i don't know that might dog. actually be absolutely uh the ferris wheel that was born <laughs> the here ferris, the model t ford i mean there's a lot of cool <laughs> things that have come out of the states and and it's not even it's like the american identity is an identity of nothingness we're everything and nothing you know and that's really cool you know um so i i i at the risk of sounding like a right-wing maniac i'm, I'm proud of being american because Me too. what i know of america is awesome you know, yeah. in addition to all the horrible things. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I like that because we could always be better. And I like the idea that, you know, it's don't turn a blind eye to this. This is something that's important. Yeah. And, be aware. Be, be an yeah. intelligent person who's aware of your flaws, but also take solace in the fact that it's not all bleakness. You know, right. That's why you finish sad. with the taco. You close with the taco. I get it. Like yeah. the, the most American thing there is, a taco. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, isn't that the export that, uh, not that, but uh, like the export that everybody gets, like KFC. Isn't that how the world oh knows God, America? I know, it's terrible. <laughs> KFC and, yeah, and Marlboro cigarettes. Oh, yeah. we could have done so much better. <laughs> oh, well, they also got jazz. They also got, uh, they also got those, you know, Aaron Spelling soap operas. I don't know. They also got David Byrne. You know, we have David Byrne. Well, I mean, like hip hop music. Don't tell music, me he's Canadian. That was born not. here, you know. So yeah, you know, that's a huge staple of the entire world musically. So yeah, I mean, exactly. yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> many, so many good and thing, bad we're things. We're messy together. and we're a, what is it? Messy and we're a, an unruly people. Yeah, uh, yeah. I like it. <laughs> we're no prison island like Australia, but we are pretty unruly. We are pretty unruly. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. I know you've got a jet pretty soon and we're getting close to time. So I figure we uh, we stick a fork in it right here. I just wanted to say thank you for your time. It's truly a gift and I appreciate it, especially on the tail end of COVID. You're a trooper, but uh, also getting to know you a little bit. I yeah, can likewise. see why you would say, uh, you know, F it, we're doing it anyway. <laughs> so thank you so much. And it was it was awesome getting to know you a little bit. Yeah, you too, Greg. I, I, uh, I feel like I want to turn the tables and interview you now, but... All right. Well, you do have, oh, see, we didn't have enough time for anything. Don't you have kind of a podcast that you, the perfume on the radio that you perfume do? Perfume on the radio. <laughs> All right. And I listened to your, your um, crazy cat lady episode today. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you hear my so, cats? <laughs> I did hear your cats. And so I would definitely, yeah, see, you are just so multifaceted. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's insane. Like it drives me crazy. Like when I see somebody who's have amazing artistic talent at one thing i mean that's bad enough but then when they have you know multiple avenues and i saw you like in a picture with a ukulele so i'm officially you know hating you at this yeah. point anyway i digress i'm a very bad ukulele player but yeah i have yeah. one <laughs> well, it's, i'm sure you're fantastic compared to how i could hit it see i just never touched one but uh i want to ask you if people are listening to this and they want to interact with you in any way you like um how would you do that social media websites yeah, I mean, what I do you mean, what do you want people to to hit. Sort of like social media adverse, you know, on my personal life, but yeah, me too. Um, Saskia CWB is my handle. Uh, it's a private account, but I am generous with the, with the accepts. Uh, and then uh, for website art and olfaction.com is really the the place. All right. Well, I mean, you have a Instagram account for art and olfaction as well, right? Yeah. Art and yeah. olfaction. Yeah. All right. So we'll, and that seemed to be pretty active, correct? That's very active, but it's but it's a little promotionally, you know, it's so, a little promo -y. Yeah. So, yeah. Why not? It's a great yeah, avenue. I know. And I and I I like the content. I already followed it. It was yeah. pretty cool. Okay. I was feel a little <laughs> like, oh god, here we are. We have another class. <laughs> <laughs> Just you kind of have to, I guess. So I don't know. You always got to be pushing that brand. Got to be pushing that brand. You got to you got to eat. That's what I'm saying. More uh, tacos. Yeah, more tacos. Thanks to oh. Instagram. All right. Well, thank you for being open and honest. Thank you for your time. And 
I couldn't have asked for anything more. You are like a super chill. I love your vibe. Um, if you ever get out here to Texas, I would love to to show you what our sloppy, nasty tacos are like down here. Yum. They're Where in amazing. Texas are you? I'm in uh, College Station. So if you ever go to Austin, I'm only an hour yep. and a half from there. If you okay. ever go to Houston, I'm an hour and a half from there as well. Oh, nice and central. Mm -hmm. Right in the middle of everything. So I'm going to click stop on everything and thank you.